Hello, Star Trek fans. We are Rebinge It, and this is our Star Trek Prodigy podcast. My name is James. And my name is Kim, and we are watching and overanalyzing each episode of Star Trek Prodigy like true Star Trek geeks. Hit it. Welcome back to the podcast. Today, we are covering Season 2, Episodes 3 and 4 of Star Trek Prodigy. Indeed. Episode 3 is titled, Who Saves the Saviors? And I have the notes for that one. And then we will move on to Episode 4, which is called Temporal Mechanics 101. (laughs) And James will cover that one. And then like last time, we will analyze and discuss as we go. And at the end, we will talk about things that really stood out for us. And then we will do a little speculating for the future. Oh, absolutely. I have my speculation notes already. (laughs) And our kid correspondent, Mahi, is still traveling with her family, so she will not be in this episode. We do hope to catch up with her when she gets back at the end of the month. International jet setter. Indeed. So as a reminder, you can always email any feedback to us at rebingeit at gmail.com, and you can also put it on the designated episode posting on the Talk Through Media Facebook group, which is at facebook.com slash groups slash Star Trek TTM podcasts. Just do whatever is easiest for you. Join the group. Just talk about Star Trek if you want to. So before we start on today's episodes, do you have any comments from the last podcast? I am really enjoying this series so far. (laughs) Those first two episodes were a good welcome back to a show that has been missed. Oh, yeah, definitely. I had a few people poke me for not loving episode two. Well, myself included. (laughs) Yeah, it just wasn't the strongest episode. But, I mean, don't panic. I still love the show. Don't worry. Part of the challenge I think that I'm having is that the wait was too long (laughs) in between seasons. And it's like, you know, it's too much anticipation. This wait was nothing. I mean, look at Stranger Things. I mean, the last season was out like, Seven years ago, I think. (laughs) It is funny in streaming how long it is between seasons just normally. And then, of course, all the strikes are confusing everything and Paramount being idiots and dropping Prodigy confused it. And yeah, Yeah, it's a mess. Before we start the episode, you know, we are two weeks away from Comic-Con now and there's going to be a Prodigy panel at Comic-Con. Yeah, that's exciting. It is in Hall H, though, I think, which we don't normally go into Hall H. If you've never been to Comic-Con, I think we've talked about this before on one of our pods, but everybody has a different experience of Comic-Con. And if you're going to go to Hall H, that's where all the really big things happen. Like during all the the Marvel movies, everybody wanted to get in there (laughs) to see the, you know, the superheroes. And that's one sort of Comic-Con you can have, but that is a lot of sitting in lines and a lot of sort of single focus of what you're doing. And we don't normally go into that hall because we don't want to spend the whole day standing in lines. But we have been, at least I've been in there a few times for different reasons, like when there were um, Comic-Cons where there were slightly fewer people or sometimes I'll go late in the day. (laughs) Like I got into the, easily into the Star Trek panel last year because none of the actors were there, none of the writers were there because of the strikes. But that is where I learned about the musical episode of Strange New Worlds and also where they showed the crossover episode which was between fantastic. Lower Decks and Strange New Worlds, which was awesome. <laughs> so, you know, good things do happen in that hall, but you got to generally be willing to stand in line. So I don't know if we will yeah. go to the Prodigy panel or not. We'll see how it works on the day. That's the best way, I think, of approaching Comic-Con, of just see what happens on the day. Yeah, we pick a lot of things that we're interested in. And so you've got options. Right. So you can look at sort of where you are in the convention center if you're close to one, or maybe you've seen multiple things on the same topic and you want to do something else, and then you can just pick something different. Yeah. But you have to you have to not freak out if you miss something <laughs> and just go to something else and accept that you're going to something else. I think if you're too stressed out, it's not fun. Yeah. If, if you're going to get that worked up, it's not fun. Maybe you should just go and stand in line at Hall H and just go and <laughs> sit in there and don't look at anything else. But that's that's not how we enjoy we it. We have to give a shout out to frequent guest of the podcast, Teebs and Kid Phoenix, because they have a panel this year at Comic-Con. The Teebs and Kid Phoenix Multi-Generational Pop Culture Summit, which will be held on Saturday, July 27th at midday at the Neil Morgan Auditorium at the San Diego Central Library. So if you want to see Teebs and Kid Phoenix in the flesh, go to that panel. Neil Morgan Auditorium, San Diego Central Library, Saturday, July 27th at Comic-Con. 
Since it's in the library, does that mean it's outside of Comic-Con? You can go without tickets? I do not believe so. As it's a Comic-Con event, I believe it would have to be ticketed. Okay. So anybody who's dedicated can go over to the library. and. Yeah, that's exciting. Yeah, it's great for them. And we've talked about it too. We could put in for a panel, but I mean, it's just another thing we have to do. <laughs> we're, quite, <laughs> we're quite busy with the podcast itself, but also you're very focused on your cosplay. Yeah. I... And my job right now is out of control. So, yeah. <laughs> that's a good summary. Yeah. Okay. So we should get going. Yeah, I think we should. All right. I will Everybody's start. Everybody's given up listening by this point. No. <laughs> Over to you, Cam. All right, here goes Who Saves the Saviors, which is a title I think is really cool, by the way, because we know they went into the wormhole and there's trouble. <laughs> so we open on Zero, Jankum Dal, and this Vulcan Nova Squad cadet, whose name I don't think we know yet. We learn it later in the yeah. episode, but they're hurtling through the timey-wimey wormhole. <laughs> Good Doctor Who reference. The Vulcan has the wherewithal to turn on the inertial dampers to prepare them for a crash landing on Solom. I also like in this ship, the Infinity, it's got a moonroof. That's oh. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> nice touch. Nice touch, yeah. After they crash land, they use binoculars to see the destroyed city in the distance. Oh. And they also take a minute to catch the Vulcan up on how the Federation managed to accidentally kick off a civil <laughs> war on this planet, because she doesn't know the whole story. Yes. I really kind of like that of they're on the destroyed Solom, the thing they've heard so much about, and they're now there. Yeah. Jankum spots the protostar still on the ground in the distance, and they realize that they've arrived before the launch, which is exactly what Janeway said we couldn't do. Right. Whoops. <laughs> but you know what? That's pretty par for the course with the Prodigy yeah. crew. We are always exactly where we're not supposed to be. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> this, it fits their unique skill set, shall we say. It does. But somehow it always works out, which I think is also a unique skill set that they have. That's also a very original series. Star Trek type events. You know, it kind of is. It's it's like, which episode is it where one of them says from the original series, once again, we've saved civilization as we I know it? I believe it was the end of... I think it was six. I believe it was the end of the sixth movie. But you could really almost say it at the end of every movie. <laughs> well... And you could say it at the end of the Prodigy Definitely the end of the Wales movie. as well. Without question. That's true. Back on Voyager, everybody is worried about the potential disaster that this has caused to the timeline. Of course, there's no sign of the Infinity, and they still don't know who that bubble voice belonged yeah. to. Rock Talk and Murph come in and tell Janeway that the launch was an accident, <laughs> and Dal tried to stop it. And Janeway is like, ugh. Was that a Janeway why maneuver? Why did I bring these kids on board? Was that a Janeway maneuver? You know, it was very close. I, I can imagine that this is one of the times where Kate Mulgrew, while doing this, was actually rolling her <laughs> eyes because Janeway would have absolutely rolled her oh, eyes. Oh, yes, yes. I don't, this is my one criticism of the animated version of Janeway. Yeah. She does not roll her eyes enough because that is a huge feature of Janeway in Voyager, as we are seeing in our uh, other podcast. Right. Back on Solom, Dal wants to save Chakotay, but Zero and the Vulcan tell him that they can't interfere or they're going to screw up the timeline. I do like Dal's line of thinking here, that they should follow the mission brief, which was rescuing Chakotay. Yes, and he wants to be the hero always, right? Oh, that's true. That is the Kirky inside of him. <laughs> yeah. They've just got to stay out of trouble for four hours or so, and then they can rescue Chakotay. That's the story. Not a, with this lot, not a chance. Not a chance, no. Here's another Star Trek move when the Vulcan covers her ears with a headband and, uh, you know, she also hides the comm badges just in case they're spotted. The Wales movie. Mm hmm. Oh, that happens. Yes. In the Wales movie. But it also happens in Star Trek itself. Yeah. You know, in the in the original series, it also happens in Voyager when Tuvok has to cover his ears. It's a very common thing. But the headband is straight out of the Wales movie. But of course, they're spotted immediately when some Solom cops drive up on their <laughs> motorcycles. <laughs> Motorcycle cops, they're everywhere. Now we have this really cool transition where the destroyed Solom landscape morphs yeah. into the thriving Solom landscape yes. in the normal timeline. That was really cool. We backed that up and watched that, that a few times. That was great. Now, quick question here. Yeah. So does everyone in Starfleet just have civvies underneath the uniforms? They're not wearing skivvies. Civvies. Civilian clothes. Civvies. Civvies. Well, I didn't think they were wearing civilian clothes under those uniforms because they had the same things on. But they took off the Starfleet jumpsuits and had just regular clothes underneath. But they had the same clothes, which implies it's a uniform. Which implies it's a coverall. Well, 
they were still wearing the same things. Dell and the Vulcan still had the same like tops on underneath. So couldn't that be part of the uniform? Well, they actually took them off. So just the top, which is something that Kira did at one point as well. And she had like that short sleeve or that yeah. sleeveless thing on underneath. This was similar to me. So I'm thinking the what they're wearing underneath those cadet uniforms are part of the uniform because maybe sometimes you need to take that jacket off because it's hot. So this is just the official Starfleet sweater that they're wearing. I think so. Okay, so back on the non-destroyed Solum, Tahani, also known as Asensia, wants the council to track down Gwendala, but no big deal because in she comes walking with her dad. Yep. Who now, instead of calling him the Diviner, we're calling him Ilthurin, I think is his name. Ilthurin. Ilthurin. Gwyn says she'll prove herself as a real Vaunacot by challenging Tahani slash Asensia to Valura. As Tahani protests, one of the council members says, This has been a sovereign ritual since the beginning, and if we do not honor our past, we do not deserve a future. Interesting. Which was a great dramatic line. (laughs) But then she's like, fight, fight, fight. (laughs) (laughs) You know, this, again, the visuals in this scene, the High Council scene reminded me of the movie Hellboy, The Golden Army, the Elven King with, with the very ornate headgear. Yeah, I have a note later about just how beautiful this episode yes. is. And and it's still, again, the art design, but also uh, the the colors are just intense right. when they're on solo. It's beautifully done. Yeah, I totally agree. And I love what we're seeing from Essentia here. She's delivering these great lines like, poisonous rhetoric is taking root. <laughs> and I'm yeah. thinking, like, what exactly is meant by this? Is it ideas like the lower classes should have a say in government? What does that translate to? What exactly is this poisonous rhetoric? I think the poison rhetoric is that the Federation doesn't want to cause trouble and is really just trying to be a positive force. And all of these different planets banding together is a a good thing. I think that's the rhetoric. Even though we know it's a positive thing, Gwen knows it's a positive thing. When... The Federation landed on Solom. It triggered this civil war that caused the the, the mess that we're in, basically. So Essencia's point is simply, that was all a lie, right? So she's just saying, that's the rhetoric. This is just baloney. But of course, her vision is completely colored by what happened on the planet. Right, growing up in the war, because she seemed quite young when we saw her in her real timeline. But, you know... It probably had nothing to do with the Federation. I think we talked about this in season one. It's just, for some reason, this planet just couldn't come together and, you know, look at this as a positive and just try to move forward. Instead, they just started infighting, which sounds a lot like what's going on in a certain country (laughs) right now, which we are not going to talk about. Well, I feel that we've kind of backed away from the some of the lines that the Diviner said in season one, like the confident in our supremacy. And what exactly does that mean? Were they, did they see themselves as the only race in the universe and this is what caused the civil war? Well, it's interesting to think about that because it seems like the diviner now, he's quite, I don't know, maybe innocent isn't the right word, but he's certainly curious. Open-minded? About, yeah, open-minded about what's going on yeah. in the rest of the planets around them. And at some point later, he becomes very jaded. Yeah. And he, I guess he gets caught up in the rhetoric, the internal rhetoric to the planet. Like we are superior. The entire problem was we let somebody else in. We we let lessers in. We've let lessers in. And of course, we've seen this as a theme many times in Star Trek and in the history of the world. Whenever somebody thinks that they are just inherently superior to somebody else, we have some problems. (laughs) Right, right. I do feel they seem to have backed off from this a little bit, or maybe the Problem is, only Essentia is delivering this message. Yeah, she's just got her own version of events, and they don't know it yet. Before we move on, I do have to question, though, Gwyn challenging Essentia to Valora. Did she forget Essentia kicked her butt once before and killed her father? Yeah, but they never talked about the fact that it was going to be a fight to the death or something like that. Remember, because she asked, and they sort of acted like they didn't know Back with the captured crew and all of their weapons and tools, including Jankum's hand, is confiscated. Zero thinks it's a good thing because if they're locked up, they can't interfere in Chakotay's actions. 
But bad news, <laughs> because they're thrown in the same cell as Chakotay and the bird guy. Yes. They try not to let on who they are when Chakotay approaches, and Del just says, uh, nice tattoo. And they claim to be galactic traders, which seems quite improbable in this story. Yeah, they don't seem very Ferengi. No, and Jankum pokes on the force field that's holding them in. And the bird guy's like, there's no way out. <laughs> and Jankum says, whatever, bird. And thus begins the bird references. <laughs> oh, from... <laughs> yes. The bird puns <laughs> start Jankum. from here on in. Oh, Jankum. Jankum is my favorite character who is not Janeway. There is a lot to be said for Jankum. He's so funny in this episode. And Dal is like, uh, y'all are going to escape, right? And Chakotay tells Bird Guy at this point, sometimes you just have to take a leap of faith. And I wrote this line down yeah. because this is something Janeway says in season one of Voyager. Oh. So I like that tie-in. Nice. And then he asks if they can keep a secret. And of course, we all know from the first two episodes that they should have said, no, <laughs> no, we really can't. Not a chance. Yeah. Please don't tell us. Not if we <laughs> even wanted That's to. That's a terrible idea. Chakotay shows them a tricorder they managed to smuggle into the cell, but that's all they have. At one point, Jankum says, check out the beak on a Dreek <laughs> when he learns the bird guy's <laughs> name. Oh, Jankum. Jankum is a delight in this oh, episode. Yes. They've been using the tricorder to try and get a message to Starfleet, saying it's not good for breaking them out of the cell. The crew now whispers to each other that this doesn't make any sense, that they're trapped in here and can't get out. And then Zero and I, at the same time, realize, well, it's possible that they were meant to be there to help yeah. Chakotay and Adrik break out of the cell. And the Vulcan talks about other causal time loops in Starfleet history, like the Bell Riots, yes. which we're quite familiar with from Deep Space Nine. Ben Sisko is in that. Or the Cochrane Warp Test. That was the movie First, First Contact. Contact. And let's not forget the greatest of all, the Mars O'Brien anomaly. <laughs> I love after the Vulcan says that, Dal says, I don't know what just came out of your mouth. <laughs> that really made me laugh because he never knows anything that's going on. Yes, a causal time loop. Back on Solom, and we are about to start the trial. We've got the Vindicator and the Mini-Me Vindicator in the background. Yep. This is where I really took note of the intense colors. Absolutely stunning. Yes, it really is. Uh, even the, the ends of the weapons now are bright pink. It's great. Yeah, it was cool. I love the dig that Asensia makes to the Diviner, saying, you're as weak as I remember. Oh, she's so mean. And then the elders make that big statement about the will of your ancestry will be tested. I feel there's a lot of problematic things that the Vorna cats say. <laughs> yeah. They, they honestly don't seem ready to make contact with the Federation yeah. with some of these attitudes. If they start making any statements about will of steel and determination alone leads to victory, that's really when oh, you should just geez. start cutting them off. So this ritual seems to be that the two individuals competing have to leave their weapons behind and get dropped into a giant pit. <laughs> yeah. The two council leaders do a glowy thing with their heads and the platform starts to lower. Well, Gwyn asks what the test is, and they just say, that is for you to discover. I feel like he could have at least said, now, have you ever seen Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome? <laughs> I wonder if they don't know what it is supposed to be. Like, what is this? We just drop two down and whoever comes out <laughs> is the winner. But what? <laughs> we, yeah, we don't, don't ask know. what happened to the other one. Because there's really, yeah, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. You could just say, yeah, it's a cage match. Only one person lives. Yeah, but we don't, yeah, we don't say that. Tahani at this point, or Essencia, says, <laughs> your friends can't help you now, which is a weird thing to say because Gwen has no friends there. So I don't know what that was about. Yeah. As they're going down, there are some glowing gold specks in the air all around them, and Gwen says she can feel it's the source of their heirlooms. Spice. And before, yes, and before they get all the way to the bottom, Essencia's head starts to glow, and she manages to form a weapon from the particles in the air and starts attacking Gwen. Yeah. And now we have a very long battle where Gwen holds her own, but Essencia does seem to have the upper hand. Yeah, this was a great fight. Uh, I loved how Gwyn figures out how to use the heirlooms. Yeah, really yeah. quickly. Yeah. Because she is a Vaunacott. Oh, well, ridiculous. yeah. Or she is Jedi. <laughs> I mean, that could be the test, is that are you able to use these particles? Yeah. Are you able to use these particles and kill the other person that you're in there? 
<sighs> yeah. <laughs> the Vanu cat have problems. Let's let's just deal with it. Why? <laughs> yeah. Back to the future, and Jankum is poking at the tricorder, <laughs> continuing to make bird puns. Quit squawking. Jankum knows how to wing it. It's full of them. The bird guy tells Jankum he can't do anything with that tricorder, but Jankum says, Jankum Pog politely disagrees. <laughs> <laughs> and he is able to activate his confiscated hand from a distance, which jumps up and runs along like Thing from the Adams Family. That, too, was awesome. It was a really fun scene as the hand runs around and Jankum controls it from the controller like it's a video game. That would actually make a very good video game. Eventually, it breaks them free and Jankum gets his hand back and he takes down a scorpion robot thing. Yeah, he puts his hammer hand to great use there. And at one point, the Vulcan does a Vulcan nerve pinch, which makes Chakotay wonder, who are you guys? <laughs> Did you notice here that Chakotay calls them galactic raiders? They said they were traitors. Yeah, not galactic raiders. Yeah, where did that come from? Did the <laughs> script change or something? I don't know. I didn't notice that. Yeah. I do find it surprising that Chakotay and Birdman did not even get a hint that maybe they were using Federation tech because of Zero. I think they do have the hint, and I think they purposely yeah. let it go because of the timey-wimey stuff. <laughs> oh. Because yeah. there's a point later where they see the Vulcan has a tricorder. Oh, right. And they don't push the... And they don't push it. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think they're purposefully saying, okay. Okay, we'll just roll we're with We're not this. supposed to have that conversation. Yeah. yeah. Is this temporal prime directive stuff? That's what I'm thinking. Zero at this point is really excited because it looks like the crew has actually helped to make the whole thing happen. The thing yes. that needs to happen. But we are way too optimistic this early in the episode. <laughs> there is no way this is going to go smoothly from here if you know anything about television. <laughs> Plus, it's team chaos. Oh, yeah. Good point. Back in the hand-to-hand -hand battle and Gwyn tries to talk to Hani Asensia down from her anger, saying she's afraid of something that hasn't even happened yet. But this clearly isn't working. And when Asensia throws a bunch of weapons at her and they get stuck in the wall of the pit, Gwen starts using them as stairs to climb upwards, and Tahani starts running after her. Now, in this fight, Asensia said she is going to ensure the right side wins. Mm. So she's already starting to blow up the timeline. She's changing it. She wants to blow up the timeline. Well, she's trying to change everything. Well, she's not paying any attention to no, she what's doesn't care. likely to happen to Solem. No, that's her whole point with coming back. She's very short-sighted. Of course she is. She's a villain. <laughs> <laughs> I feel this fight as well is maybe a microcosm of the Civil War or the attitudes that led to the Civil War. It's like the whole problem with Solem in miniature. Well, if we look at what we're talking about with how the crew ending up on Solom is maybe what led to them actually being able to send the protostar into the future. Yeah. We can look too at Tahani Asensia. I keep wanting to call her Tahani. Um, we can look too at her presence on Solom is probably what causes the whole problem, is what causes yeah. the civil war. All of her shouting about things is what's going to lead to the problem. <laughs> Right. It's her. like a self, the whole thing is a big self-fulfilling prophecy. Well, that's why I wonder, you know, is, is this the direction we are heading that it becomes another causality loop? Yes, as, uh, I think so. Uh, have we learned her name yet of the Vulcan? No. Okay. We learn it right at the end when Zero says it. Okay. At the end of your episode. Yeah. Gwyn also does deliver a great line here saying, I don't need to fight you to save Solom, only to leave you behind. I think that was a good, both literal and figurative, description. Yes. Back in the future, Chakotay and Bird Guy notice a lot of guards are blocking their path to the Protostar, so Dal volunteers to distract them. Chakotay sees now that they have a Starfleet tricorder, but Dal just says, there's no time to talk, get going. <laughs> yeah, something's up there. So the crew manages then to get the Dreadnoughts and the Scorpion-like bug robots to chase them, allowing Chakotay and Adrik to get to the Protostar, which is what they wanted. Yep. As we saw in the tape that Janeway had. Yeah. Seems to be working as everything is looking to be on schedule, like when Bird Guy gets shot just as Chakotay is working on the Protostar. That's yep. what happened in the recording. And they're all very excited. Although, where did that recording come from? Um, one of the Dreadnoughts had a dash cam. But how did they get it? 
to the protostar. Mm. How do they get it through the world? Okay, you know what? We don't need to figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> don't ask too many questions Yeah, about the timey-wimey stuff. Okay, the protostar has some um, cameras on it that's watching all this stuff, you know? Yeah, I don't know that it's from the right angle for that is the mm. only thing. They may have explained that and I missed it, but anyway. Their crew is all very excited that they fixed everything. So then, of course, something different happens when Chakotay picks up a disruptor, fires, and then gets on the protostar with Bird Guy. Well. Dell is like, mm, that's no big deal, right? Everything is fine. <laughs> well, that disruptor was the one that was shot out of Dell's hand, hand when yeah. he was on the bike causing the disruption. And at this moment, the Vulcan, much like my Uncle Arlo, very calmly says, this is catastrophic. <laughs> And I really laughed. <laughs> because, yes, it is. On the protostar now, Chicote mentions the temporal shielding, which I didn't remember that ship having, but yeah. that's fine. I can't remember anything. And the ship takes off with Chicote and Birdman on board, which is not what was supposed to happen. And this seems very bad. And the young crew hears some beeping on the infinity, and they run in to see that chroniton emissions are spiking and there are tachyon irregularities, which I guess just means the timeline is getting royally yes. messed up. Oh, yeah. Well, they weren't supposed to be on the ship. That's right. And the Vulcan says, wherever the protostar went, it was not Tars Lamora, which makes Dal say, Gwen. And back on Solemn in the past, Gwen is almost to the top of the pit when she starts to phase in and out of existence. Yes. And she is unable to hold on to the things that she's using to climb. She's going full back to the future. Because she was going to win. Yeah, that's what my notes say, too. It's very back to the future. And Tahani Asensia shoots some weapons at her, but they go right through Gwen. Yeah. And Gwen now at this point just falls into the abyss. And Tahani says, huh? <laughs> but doesn't stop her. She keeps climbing. Yeah, Ascentia makes it to the surface. And Gwen is caught in a safe landing when those gold specks all sort of combine together to catch her. Yeah. And Ascentia climbs out of the hole and is declared the victor. And then they close the lid over <laughs> Gwen. So there's no question. There's no cleanup. There's no, like, is there a corpse nope. down there? They just leave yeah. it. We don't even check if she's dead. Nothing. Yeah, it's weird. I think we get the feeling that's maybe what these the people on Solom are like. <laughs> nah, we just we don't want to think about that too much. Yeah. Just close the lid. Everything's fine. It'll be fine. This is what's supposed to happen. Nobody needs to know what's down there. But you'd think there'd be more bodies down there, unless there's something else weird going on down there we don't know about. <laughs> wow. The mini me Essentia is not thrilled as the council leader person says, Behold the victor, Asensia, a proven and true Vaunacott, to lead us unto our greatest future. Well, that's just uh -oh. strengthened Asensia's appeal for all the wrong reasons. Well, it needs to get quite dark before it gets brighter. Yeah. So, in her own way, Gwyn is able to cause almost as much chaos as Dal. Well, except Gwen was going to get out of there if it hadn't been for Dal. <laughs> so, oh, good but she point, led but... down this path to challenging Ascentia. Well, she did that because that's what the diviner told her to do. That's true. And he's not the cynical monster that he became later, so. No, he's quite mild mannered. Yeah. And seems very sweet, actually. Well, that's the end of this episode. So, let's go on to episode four Temporal Mechanics 101. And I have the notes. Off to Voyager, and Murph appears to be in stellar cartography, and we see reflected in Murph's eyes, he's talking to someone, but we just see like a black outline. Looks like Armis. Oh, keep your Tasha Yars away from him then. <laughs> Tysis, also known as Antennas, is reporting that the timeline has, has been altered, and Janeway concludes that they're not affected for now because of the temporal shielding. Rockdock, of course, has an idea how they can get a message through the wormhole, Yay, Rock Talk. Ever the ideas, woman. Although, does it make sense that the temporal shielding on the infinity is somehow protecting the timeline? If you wave your hand enough, it's fine. Okay. It, it, it might make sense. Yeah. There, maybe there's a chroniton particle leak and preserving their timeline. Okay. In the future, we actually see the diviner. I don't, this is the first time we've actually seen him. Oh, right. As yeah. we know, as we come to know him. And yeah. he's ordering the ship launched the hundred ships launched which we know happened in the original timeline yes so that's so kind that of cool. part happens yeah unfortunately though the infinity is pretty much trashed <laughs> yeah 
And I'll make a comment here that the Vulcan was stating that all of this is because of Dal. Uh He was the problem and the reason why they arrived too early. I think there's a lot of blame to go around here. Uh, Yeah. I beg to differ. Yeah, but I think it's a good example of Vulcan finger pointing. Yeah, I had the same exact note where she's like, this is all your fault, (laughs) but uh, technically it's actually her fault. Yeah, clearly. (laughs) Look, I suppose if you said, how did it all start? It started because Del was flapping his gums in the hallway Yeah, and she heard it, but also she should have kept her nose out of it or she should have gone to the captain instead of what she did. That would have been the smart thing. Mm-hmm. And then the captain could have told her to, yeah, zip it and keep it quiet. Yes. A Vulcan would probably do that, actually. Yeah, a Vulcan likes to tell on humans in particular. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Zero is also worried what else in the timeline has changed. Janeway manages <laughs> to get comms working, and immediately the Vulcan grasses up Dal, saying they lost Chakotay in the wormhole. Yeah. But they lose comms before they can relay much more. And Tana says something about they lost contact with Gwen's ship as well, right after the ship went into, right after the Infinity went into the wormhole. And I'm not sure that timing makes complete sense. Yeah. Because, I mean, they lost contact with that ship because they weren't paying attention and they weren't being careful enough and they weren't expecting Asensia to be on Solom and that ship got destroyed. I don't think that was connected to them going into the wormhole. No, no. I think that was an assumption they were making. Yeah. That they were going, oh, well, this happened, and then the ship, we lost comms with the ship. Not putting two and two together and going, oh, apparently Asensia was already there and had shown them how yeah. to build you know, weapons to destroy Federation ships. Right. On the Infinity, the console suddenly starts giving messages and relaying them in a strange variant of what looks like a 16-segment display, like an old-school... Mm-hmm. multi-segment display. I, I assume this is the default when Starfleet things are broken. They go back to the old-fashioned display. War games. Yeah. From the 80s. <laughs> well, it delivers a message saying, save Gwyn, and then giving mm. them coordinates on the planet. Dal asks the computer if the message is coming from Voyager, and it replies, no. Zero is a little cautious about who's sending this and what the purpose is, but Dal is totally true to form. He's all in, saying, if Gwyn needs help, then they're going. It's a little bit like Janeway. We talk about her a lot in seasons one and two of Voyager. Like, she's just ready to jump in at all costs. Yeah, absolutely. Especially if it requires a phaser. She's ready to go. (laughs) A hundred percent. That's a little bit like what Dal is like. Well, one of your big observations re-watching it with Janeway has been she seems a little reckless at times. She is reckless, yeah, which is very Dal-like, for sure. Back to Gwyn, who appears to be phasing in and out of time. She has some kind of vision and hears a distorted voice telling her, stay present, this isn't your time, you need to be together. And we see, again, you talk about beautiful shots Mm. in the show, this is like a glowing nebula that is fantastic. This is when the diviner sort of drops out of that as well, or the the pre-diviner. Yes. Yeah, it's really beautiful. This is a really well-crafted animation. Gwyn wakes, seeing her father. He tells her he cannot get her out, but he promises not to leave her. This is not the diviner we're used to. Definitely not. Why do you think he can't get her out? Is it because she's phasing in and out or because that violates that whatever that ritual is that they were doing? It's unclear. I I feel both reasons are valid. Yeah. That he wouldn't want to violate Von Akat law or tradition or whatever it is. Right. And at the same time, she's phasing in and out. So you, <laughs> you can't pick her up or, or move her very easily. Dal Zero and the Vulcan are on foot to try and rescue Gwyn. The Vulcan is expressing some reservations about this course of action. And I feel if she'd known these guys from season one, she would agree <laughs> this is actually a well thought out, well organized plan in comparison. <laughs> Yeah, it's a little bit better than their normal shenanigans. Yeah. She does say something here about how being in Starfleet, we can be nothing less than perfect. Yes. Which somebody's got to get that out of her head. (laughs) I think that that's a very Vulcan sentiment about all things. Maybe, but it's quite a dangerous way to look at things that you have to be perfect. I mean, you can't be. That's true. And if you, that's true. If you do take that attitude, you could potentially pass up on really effective Starfleet officers, crew, people 
because right. you you look at them literally as like they are not perfect. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we have to pass over them. And you could be like shooting yourself in the foot of letting good people go when your standards are unrealistic. Well, it probably leads to like the thing that happened or the thing that we learned about in the Deep Space Nine episode yeah. about the baseball game. Oh, taking me out to the hollow suite yeah. where there's a whole ship that's only Vulcan. Yeah. Right. And, they're, and, and it's part of Starfleet. Right. Which seems like a very poor idea. It seems like a very bad idea. Yeah. And I, I would think this kind of attitude is what leads to that. Yeah. Well, I think you'd end up with almost kind of a bizarre intolerance from the Vulcans mm -hmm. of anybody who is less than perfect is lesser or is, should not be in that role. Right. And that's not a good attitude. No, that's what we talked about earlier. <laughs> Anytime you think you are superior to someone else, we get into trouble. Right. Well, Dal has kind of had enough of the Vulcans complaining and telling her she can always go back to the ship and help Jankum fix it. Mm -hmm. They finally arrive at the arena where Gwyn battled Essentia 50-something years before. And Zero uses his anti-gravity flying abilities to actually get them down. So we can see Zero actually can fly now. Yep. Well, he always could. At the bottom, Miss Vulcan, ever the optimist, declares, Your coordinates have led us to a sinkhole. <laughs> Do you think Mr. Uh, Tuvok is her hero? Yeah. We also learn here that it doesn't seem like Dal likes heights. Oh. In the hole, Dal uses Zero as a flashlight again. Oh, I love that. And they find Gwyn. And she's still phasing in and out of time. Zero reports that her quantum signature is displaced. And the Vulcan describes her existence as uncertain, both always and never. She's trapped mm. in Schrodinger's box. Mm -hmm. And here we learn, Gwyn is Schrodinger's cat. Mm -hmm. What fascinates me here is, I wonder what the Vulcan version of that concept is. Is this the human translation or the Starfleet standard translation of what that means? I mean, we talk about stuff like that a lot, where is it just the universal translator, you know, translating yeah. it into something that makes more sense to humans. But of course, that particular thing might not make sense to all humans all across the earth, but <laughs> we don't talk about that. Zero informs them that the phasing Gwyn is starting to degrade and they don't have time to save her. Zero also determines that the shortest distance between two points is time. Explaining to a frustrated Dal, it's simple. They just need to build a time machine. <laughs> Easy. In the past, Gwyn is telling the Diviner she heard her friends. He wants to hear more about this other timeline, when he was her Diviner. She's resistant to tell him, and he asks, Was I some sort of monster? Very diplomatically, well... Gwyn replies, It depends who you ask. Yeah, Dreadnought Ouch. really liked you. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Dreadnought, mm -hmm. would you, buddy? And very touchingly, he says to her, I'm not him. I'm putting you first. Aw. That I thought was great. And truly the 180 from the future diviner. Yeah. Gwyn then asks him what he meant when he said, you need to be together. And he tells her, I never said that. Which, and this was part of the vision. Mm-hmm. And I think as a viewer, we already knew that yeah, wasn't this him. Was a, yeah, a disembodied voice. <laughs> yes. Similar to the bubble. So I thought that was a little bit specifically telling you that yeah. this was not coming from him. Yeah, we got a mysterious figure talking to everybody. Yes. They were talking in the big bubble. Then they were Armis, but not really Armis. And then they were <laughs> typing. They're all over the place. Right. Back on Voyager, they've got comms working, and Dal tells Janeway they're going to save Gwyn. The doctor can't determine remotely what's wrong with Gwyn, delivering the classic line, I'm a doctor, not an exorcist. Yeah. And this is something, again, we've noticed in Voyager, that the doctor keeps on making these statements about the, yeah. I'm a doctor, not a fill in whatever the joke is. Yeah, which of course comes originally from Bones yeah. in the original series, but they yeah. do use it a lot with the doctor on Voyager. I did think it was a little forced here, but I'll, I'll allow it. <laughs> Zero informs Janeway they're going to travel back in time directly to Gwyn, and the Vulcan details how she studied the mission logs where Commander Worf jumped across quantum timelines. 
or she just watched that TNG episode, which, let's face it, was one of the epic episodes. Oh, is she talking about parallels? Yes. Yeah, that is one of the best episodes of all of Star Trek, yeah. Absolutely agreed. Janeway asks how she can help, and Dal requests a copy of Temporal Mechanics 101. That was very funny. <laughs> so we brought that sort of full circle. Right. I was a little confused by how Janeway was so into this plan to save Gwyn. I, yeah. I mean, why? Because Janeway is a good person and she likes Gwyn. And I think, okay. you know, Gwyn was doing this dangerous mission to go to Solom and try and save her home world. Well, that's true. Okay, so yeah, that's I, true. I think Janeway probably has a lot of respect for Gwyn trying to do that and would go out on a limb to try and save her or help her. But it is a surprise that she wouldn't be like, do not build a time machine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe <laughs> what she's are reached you the doing? point where <laughs> you guys have caused so much chaos. How much worse can you make it? Oy. We now get an awesome animated guide in which Dr. Aaron, the actual science advisor for the show, Aaron McDonald, yes. gives us a quick rundown of quantum mechanics. I thought it was great and perfectly fitted the way Dal starts reading the book, gets past the intro, and then skips forward five <laughs> chapters too. So you want to build a time machine. Oh, it's a very Dal move. First he like skips chapters two through four, yes. jumps right to five, and then he's in chapter 15. <laughs> right. He's just like skipping all around. I like this uh, video with Dr. Aaron McDonald because yeah. it reminded me of Jurassic Park. Oh, gosh, The little yes. movie they watch. Right. Yeah. You know, I think it's also important here that it shows that Dal does have the abilities, does have the capabilities to understand this and to actually do, you know, the hard work of mm. studying and yeah. learning this stuff. He just yeah. he lacks the motivation. I mean, we were talking about this earlier today, and, and I do think because he, he was being so annoying in the first two episodes, like, yeah. I don't want to learn anything. I'm already the smartest person here. And I mean, that it's like you can't be a captain and never want to learn anything. And then here, when he's under duress and he's forced to spend yeah. a little yeah. time learning, we realize that he's actually really capable. Yes. He's super smart, and he is able to pick up what he needs to pick up because he does reference stuff that he's <laughs> read a little bit later, right? So, so we know that he's learning. And that's almost like an, uh, an ADHD thing, right? right? Where it's like a very smart person, but I just, I don't have the, abil the ability to focus until I do. And then all I do is focus on it. <laughs> yeah. I, just, I thought that was really an interesting way to portray it. I can relate to Dal. You definitely can. <laughs> it was also at the end of the little animated sequence, it was funny the way it covered some of the ways we've seen time travel happen in Star Trek. Oh, yes. Yeah. I mean, when she talked about, like, she was using dominoes to say, you know, the big events still need to happen. Yeah. And you could think about, like, the bell rides and the different things that we have had already in Star Trek. Yeah. But the little things, sometimes you need to do something different to make it happen, <laughs> which, again, is like the bell rides, because they do have to do a little different thing there than what actually right. happened. But it still causes the timeline to at least go in the direction it's supposed to. I think it's it's very funny at the end when she says, and in conclusion, don't screw up time <laughs> if you don't have to, kids. Yes. And the other line as well about that, don't annoy a cue. Oh, and don't annoy a cue. That's good <laughs> advice, too. It's almost as good as don't be a Borg. Oh. You know, they actually left one huge thing out, and Harry Kim did this, stealing a Borg temporal transmitter. Well, we haven't got to that yet in our Voyager rewatch. Yes, but they should have. <laughs> yeah, they would know about it. I just don't remember yet. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm in my own time loop. They've rebuilt the Infinity as a time machine now. And as Jankum powers up this cobbled together machine, which looks very back to the future, does it not? It really does. We get Dal giving the order, go fast. And the oh, yeah. machine briefly starts to work and then just powers down. A very frustrated Jankum is having a really good rant and shouts, I did everything by the manual, why won't you work? And then beautifully resorts to a bit of the old-fashioned percussive maintenance, turning his hand yeah. into the hammer and hitting the console, and everything powers up. The visuals here are just awesome. Yeah, that was great. And this next scene is great, the way the Sentinel smashes through the window, 
And then time starts rolling backwards right. and you see the window come together and them jump off. I really like that. I thought that worked mm-hmm. very well. I thought we were a little bit hand wavy about how we got the infinity there. Yes. I had the same note. It's like, um, did you just cut fly. the whole thing? It couldn't yeah. <laughs> fly? How did you? I saw they had some pulleys rigged up to lower it, but how did they get it there yeah. if it didn't fly? Was this a time constraint thing of they had to cut all of this? Yeah, because these episodes are quite short. Yeah. So sometimes I think, hand wave, ship moved. In the past, Gwyn and the Diviner feel a rumbling, and then the Infinity jumps in. And as they disembark, Zero delivers a great line of, we didn't explode. This is that (laughs) thing where you say about how he's almost Vulcan-like, Spock-like at times, where he delivers these sort of lines like, oh, fascinating when they're in danger, or you know, we didn't explode. He's like an optimistic Vulcan. Oh, yes. Good point. Mm -hmm. Well, the team heads towards Gwyn and then all pull to a halt when they see the Diviner. Oh. Yes. But again, it's that you see this this totally different character. He seems so interested in the fact that there's intelligent life from other worlds. Mm-hmm. He seems almost in awe of it. And it, it's such a wonderful contrast, I think. Zero brings up they found her from a mysterious message delivered by someone. And Gwyn tells them she thinks she heard it too. Dal is now able finally to quote Temporal Mechanics 101. <laughs> Zero tells Dal they need to get Gwyn to Voyager. Dal asks if the Infinity will fly, and Jankum starts a bit of a rant about how everything's broken and he's all out of miracles. Yeah. Very Scotty. But suddenly, the ship takes off. It lifts up, and all the systems are coming back online. Zero observes, another gift from our mysterious benefactor? Mm. And Jankum, once again, Jankum delivers one of those lines, as saying, could have done that earlier. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I like how they're going back and em- embracing that side of Jankum, that sort of little edge that he has. He's not quite as rude as he used to be. Yeah, I think that's actually a really good development for that character, that he's like, he's trying to be polite, but he also, you know, he can't fight his own nature completely. Yes. As Dal helps Gwyn to the ship, the Diviner tells her, I hope to see you again, my daughter. And then tells the others, take care of her, please. Wow, that was such a touching scene. Knowing what the Diviner was like, how he would refer Mm -hmm. to it uh, almost clinically as his progeny. And they kind of implied, because I was thinking maybe he had turned into the Vindicator, not just at his time on Solon, but also through his time travel yes. and all of his you know, sort of being isolated. And yeah. it seemed like he'd failed a bunch of times. But it seemed like when they showed him on Solom, you know, 52 years in the future, that he'd already oh, turned into yeah. the uh, the diviner based on the Civil War. Maybe that just being a soldier had caused that. Right. To me as well, that felt very much like the diviner had already been set in how he behaved, especially when he says send 100 ships. He's like, he doesn't seem to care about the people. But it could change now that he has interacted with life from other planets and with yeah. Gwen. If that's not what started it in the first place, <laughs> oh, well, depending that's, on the timeline. But, that's a question. Yeah. As this is happening, we see Asensia now has the ear of the elders. She's telling them there are enemies amongst them and enemies above them. They must militarize for an uncertain future. Really? And this does not sound like it's going well. When you start talking about enemies within... Eesh. What was that episode of Next Gen? The Drumhead? Oh, yes, there's a good one. Hmm. This is also a nice visual cut as we see the crew and their ship flying away. And Asensia reiterates the enemies amongst us. Yeah, she's like, see? And it cuts to the Diviner climbing out of the arena. I'm like, oh, again, just really cool little directing Mm -hmm. and editing choices here. Yeah, really good. Without having to use words, you're telling the story. This is beautiful use of animation. On the ship, Gwyn tells Dal she couldn't save Solom. But Dal tells her there's always time. They'll fix her up and she'll be back to Queen of Solom in no time. Elsewhere on the ship, the Vulcan tells Zero he is the most logical of this group of misfits. (laughs) 
and we learn her name, which is Majel. Which I really hope is a tribute to Majel Barrett or Majel Barrett Roddenberry. Oh, it I'm has sure to it be. is. But it also, I hope, indicates that they intended for this character to stay around a bit. Oh, that would be great. You need a Vulcan in every good story. Yeah. She's not as good as the Vulcan on Lower Decks. That's oh. my favorite character on Lower Decks. <laughs> yes. You know, Vulcans can actually look at Medusans if they wear those, like, red visors. Yes, that's true. And, if you remember, Medusans can actually possess Vulcans for a limited period of time. Hmm, yeah. So with permission, Zero could actually get to experience being corporeal. We didn't talk about that in these two episodes no. like we did in the first two. But I know it's coming back. <laughs> back aboard Voyager, the Doctor has managed to temporarily stabilize Gwyn. And the two big mysteries of the show are now laid out. Who sent the message and who fixed the ship? Gwyn tells the others, whoever it is, she heard them. Right. Rock Talk now asks, where's Murph? And we cut to Murph, who's back in stellar cartography. And we see they're talking to a ghostly figure. Mm. Who says, finally, you're all here, but I don't have much time. They're coming for me. Good luck. And as Murph chirps, the figure disappears. The end. What does that mean? They're coming for me. <laughs> yes. Come on. Wow. Now that was an ending that left you with questions. That was good. I mean, I feel like that's a clue of who that is, that they're coming for me. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there's a little bit of that vibe in Assignment Earth. Yeah. Right? Because there's always somebody, seems like there's somebody's trying to stop him from doing whatever he's doing. Although it's Kirk. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very, yes. Okay, that's, that's very confusing. There was that just, side of it. I, I, just, I just confused myself. But we can talk about that a little bit more when we get to Speculation Corner. Okay. Okay, let's talk about what stood out. Jankum is hilarious. He's a delight in this episode. He's great. Episode three, the consistent bird puns was hilarious. <laughs> and I can't remember which one it was where Chakotay said, you have to admit, that was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> and the bird guy's like, no. <laughs> yes. I think the other thing that stood out for me is, again, I loved going back to this found family aspect of the crew. Yeah. And Gwyn being in trouble and them receiving this message, save Gwyn. There's no question what they're doing. Dal will put himself yeah. on the line and will go out to do whatever is needed. It shows such a strong team dynamic that I think this is one of the things that stands out in this show. Yeah, and it's something that's present in Star Trek Voyager yeah. as well. So, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, part of maybe the differentiator with yeah. Star Trek Voyager is that group, they ended up there not all for the same reasons because yeah. there's that mixture of the Maquis crew, right, along with the Starfleet crew. And Tom. But they've only got, yeah, and Tom. and But they've only got each other. Right. And I think that's a very similar vibe to the Prodigy crew. Yeah. You know, where they've, they've sort of only got each other all through season one. It's a similar heart, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And now they do have some other positives around them, but they still need to stick together or feel the need to stick together to be their strongest. We talked about it last year of what will, or last season of what will happen if they're all separated. And it does make more sense when they're all together. Oh, right. Agreed. If I remember one of my predictions, it was Gwyn would follow her own storyline. So it's interesting to see that we're four episodes in and Gwyn is now reabsorbed into the primary storyline. Yeah. I'm very much in favor of that. Next thing I'm going to bring up, I think the voice acting of Jamila Jamil as Asensia is perfect. Yeah, she's really good. She gives this great sense of contempt and arrogance and just hatred. It's really something. Yeah, I think she's really good. I think she's better than good. I'm just impressed that she never crosses that line into Pantomime Villain. She delivers this character who just seems focused and evil and uncompromising uh, with this, like I said, this sense of arrogance. Yeah, I to totally agree. Also, we've got a shout out to Walternet. <laughs> 
Yeah, John Noble. <laughs> because think how much he's changed with what he's doing yes. with his character in this season than what he had to do in season one. Exactly. And with the the beauty of animation is he can be a younger version of himself <laughs> right. without any problem. Yeah. yeah. One of the things that really stood out to me was just how stunningly beautiful episode three is. Yes, agreed. Yeah, the visual design and the colors are spectacular. Yeah. I think, in my opinion, having watched things like Star Wars Rebels and The Bad Batch and the other Star Wars cartoons, this, I think, is where the real difference comes in of the color palette and the look of Prodigy is so vastly different by this point that it's shocking the difference between the two. Both of them are enjoyable series and both of them are, you know, great animation and are fun to watch. But I think the animation difference and the color and the design is so radical on Prodigy. It's standout. Yeah, agreed. It has a much more lifelike quality to it because yeah. it's so vivid yes. in its colors. Yeah. And, and I don't mean that it looks more realistic. <laughs> it's just there's just so much more life that yes. seems to come yeah, from it mean. because of the intense colors. Agreed. What else for you? I really like this implication that we had to go to the future for Chakotay to send the protostar into the past. But then when we get to the end of this little story, we turn it completely on its head and it's like, oh, no, now we just actually screwed everything up. <laughs> I thought that was really yeah. good. I, I, I like that. And Gwen trying to talk Asensia out of her crazy is such a Star Trek thing. Oh, agreed. That's, right. That's something we do across all of Trek. That was impressive what I was referred to as the Picardian approach of she's trying to talk <laughs> yes. down her enemy and say, this isn't, it doesn't have to be like this. Well, I mean, Kirk did it too. Yeah. We've done it in every version of Star Trek. And uh, my other things that stood out, we've sort of already hit on, yeah. which is Jank and Pog continues to be the best. <laughs> He's just so dang funny. I loved his two rants. It was great. I'm really enjoying this version of him where he's yeah. trying to be more polite because clearly that's the feedback he's been given. And so he's trying to take it on board, right, right. but yet he's just still so funny. <laughs> I, I hope they don't stop doing that yeah. and just revert him, you know, to, to how he was in the beginning. Because this, I think, is just so much funnier, you know, as he, he's just desperately trying. <laughs> because, you know, his story, we talked about Rock Talk's story being maybe the most... Um, uh, tragic? Maybe the, maybe the saddest and the most yeah. tragic of the stories. But Jenkins' story is also exceedingly sad. And and he's so he's so capable, you know, at, at what yeah. he is capable of doing in en as an engineer. And the same with Rock Talk. And the, maybe for more for them than than the rest of them. This is such a great opportunity for them. And you can see how much they want it to work. Oh, out. agreed. Right. And I, I just that really stands out for me. And I really like that. And the the last thing I had in my list was I really hope in that moment when Captain Janeway or Admiral Janeway finds out that Dell was involved in the Infinity going into the wormhole, I really hope Kate Mulgrew rolled her eyes <laughs> when she delivered that line, because that's what Jane would do. I wonder, okay, this is, <laughs> I wonder if actors who've traditionally been live action, like Kate Mulgrew, when they do voice work like this, mm -hmm. if they end up actually, you know, acting the scenes as they're recording it or like doing yeah. the eye rolls or doing the movements. And I and really hope so. Especially, you know, if she did this role for seven years, how much of that when she's reading these scripts would just come out muscle memory yeah. playing this character that she's become so comfortable with. I do hope so. Well, should we do a little speculation corner? Oh yes. I mean, we have to talk about who this mysterious figure is and I have some thoughts. Okay, you first. Just sort of looking at the history of Star Trek, and you know, I can't remember everything. I have terrible memory. We've established <laughs> that because I can barely remember <laughs> what happened on Voyager, yeah. even though I know I watched them all. But I, of course, was hoping at first that this was that we kept calling him Marlon Brando in that episode yes. where the Cosimo, Cosimo, where I don't know somehow the time streams 
cross or some I don't know. There's some Ghostbusters thing about the streams crossing, <laughs> and Harry ends up in, in a Francisco, whole different timeline. Yeah, yeah, as a warp engineer. And so we were. I was thinking maybe it's that character. If we're if we're really gonna stick with stuff that happened on Voyager, yeah. right? That's that's one of the things that could happen. I I know there's more timey wimey stuff to come yeah, in Voyager yeah. that we haven't gotten to yet because we're still in season two. So I was thinking that, but then there's something about that line that he says or that the mysterious figure yeah. says about you know they're coming for me or whatever that made me think of Gary 7 and I'm not I'm not 100% sure why what is leading me to that but but that assignment earth is that not what we did in Picard yes. with Wesley Crusher? Yes. So maybe it's it's either Wesley or maybe it's that Wesley was part of that group. Right. So maybe it's him or maybe it's the alien that Wesley met in yeah. the first season of The Next Generation that he also had some time thing going on with him. I can't remember what the name of that alien was, but if it could be any of those things or it could be a Q. Oh. A Q would actually be kind of funny <laughs> at this point, but I hope it's not a Q, yeah. honestly. Uh, Q's a little I, bit that's too, too much. much. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, agreed. that's too much. I think this is the non-evil Essentia. <gasps> oh, I hope that's who it is. Because, because my next note is I really hope the young Essentia is the one to stop the yes. older jaded Essentia. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Hmm. Wonder how she gets into the timey wimey thing. <laughs> if that's her. I hope it's her. Yeah. I don't think it is, but I hope it's her. Well, I kind of like the concept of the younger version of yourself looking at an awful version of a future you <laughs> and going, yes. no, absolutely no. What happened to me? Yeah. I used to be happy. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, that's, yeah, that's a good speculation. Yeah. And do you want some more speculation? Okay. The diviner is too nice not to die. Oh, I think you said that in the last episode. I'm I'm sticking yeah. with it because this guy is great. He's putting Gwen first. He yeah. wants to see her again. He seems so wonderfully positive about meeting the others, you know, life from another world. It's almost like, you're going to kill him, aren't you? Oh, man. Well, I do hope not, but I see where you're coming from. Okay, should we move on to some feedback? Sure. Before we do rating? Go for it. We did hear from Jeff, X-Force 11. Let me play that. Well, hello, Star Trek fans. It's Jeff, X-Force 11, leaving my feedback about Prodigy, Who Saves the Saviors, and Temporal Mechanics 101. So I thought this was very interesting to get a backstory on some of the traditions of Solem and to see this rite of passage and to see Gwen fail at it because of the temporal anomaly, and yet getting to see her father in such a different light because of the change that her being there has made in his life. And I really got a kick out of in temporal mechanics, them working on the ship, and with that effects and the robotic life forms on top of it. It's straight out of the Matrix movies. So that was <laughs> kind of fun. But I really am drawn into the mystery of who is trying to help them and who has the abilities and the powers in order to make a ship that damaged, fixed, to communicate across timelines and so much more. Part of me says it's Chakotay from a different timeline or a different reality. That was my first thoughts. And then I was wondering, is it a future version of Murph? I'm just drawn into this mystery, but I am really appreciating how they are continuing to develop our crew that we love from last season and then adding that with new characters along the way. It is just an amazing season so far. All right, those are my thoughts. X-Force is out. Thank you, Jeff. Good feedback as ever. I like that idea of, could this be Murph? <laughs> I don't think it's Chakotay. Yeah. But yeah, thanks for the feedback, Jeff. 
The only other feedback we got was from Wes on the Facebook page where he said that he really loved Aaron McDonald's uh, explanation (laughs) of Temporal Mechanics 101. Yeah, that was really cute. It it had such a a Jurassic Park feel. I really like that. Yeah, We do hope to see Aaron at uh, Comic-Con again. Yeah. All right. That is it, I think. So let's go to rating. So do you want to give your rating on each episode? Yes. Episode three. Who saves the saviors? (laughs) Ten. Naturally. And episode four, Temporal Mechanics 101, a (laughs) ten. These are great episodes. Oh, you are so funny. They are wonderfully encapsulated pieces of Trek. I thoroughly enjoy them. I can wave my hands at any of the issues that minor things that you could tweak in the storyline. But I think overall, it works really well. I am thoroughly enjoying this. This is a great Trek show. Yeah, I really liked both of these episodes as well. I think I'd give them, maybe both of them deserve an eight. Yeah. I might give episode four like seven, nine, nine, just to say I like three a little bit better. But <laughs> yeah. I don't yeah. know. It's pretty close because I did like the way we ended yeah. with, you know, a little bit of a cliffhanger there was pretty good. The way we split them up has made these cliffhangers a bit painful because now we're going to have to wait a bit to get to the to get to the cliffhanger. But overall, these are these were great. I really enjoyed them. Absolutely. OK, so come back next time then for episodes five and six. We are currently releasing these every other week, but who knows? If we go faster, then, you know, we'll release them faster. But this is the schedule that we're on right now as we're preparing for Comic-Con and all kinds of other things are going on. And if we do get into the panel for Prodigy uh, at Comic-Con, we will report on that. But hard to know if we'll get in there. It'll depend on what happens on the day. Yes. So come back next time then for episodes five and six. And in the meantime, you can always email us at rebingit.gmail.com. If you've got some input you want to give us, we are, of course, on the different socials at Rebingit. Uh, we are on YouTube, the thing that used to be called Twitter, Instagram, threads at Rebingit. And you can join the Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash Star Trek TTM podcasts. Thanks for joining Rebingit on the Star Trek Prodigy podcast. That's it for me. And that's it for me. And don't be a Borg. And listen to Janeway. <laughs>